Well, good morning and welcome to our life group lesson for Sunday, November the 1st. Today's lesson is titled Committed to His Word, and the scripture that we will be studying today is Psalm 119, 1 through 11. Psalm 119, 1 through 11. And so I wanted to share with you some thoughts about what it means to be committed to God's Word. And so the, the underlying point that the author is trying to make is that God's Word is trustworthy guidance for my life. God's Word is something I can put my trust in, I can put my faith in. It's worthy of my following, it's worthy of my studying, it's worthy of my care, my thought. It's worthy of me placing my trust into it. Why is that? Well, let's look at what skeptics say about the Bible. <clears throat> the one thing you will hear over and over and over again, and I've heard it all my life, the Bible is just a book that was written by men. A bunch of men just wrote this book, okay? That's true, except we believe that the Bible was inspired by God through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, why do I believe that? Well, if you look at the Bible, we have 66 books that we put together and collectively called the Bible, the Word of God. Those 66 books were written by at least 40 different authors over a period of about 1,500 years and over numerous countries. So when you think about how the Bible came to be, it's not as if someone or even a group of people said, hey, let's write a Bible and say it's God's Word and let's just get that done. This was compiled over centuries. Centuries. Now, stop and think for a moment. Suppose you had the ability somehow to uh, leave money in a trust and leave some institution somewhere to oversee this work, and you decided that you were going to try and recreate something like the Bible. And so uh, upon your death with the trust going into effect, the institution would choose its first author to write the first book or maybe a couple of them, I don't know, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, and then 20, 30 years later, another author would be chosen to write another book. And then maybe 40 or 50 years later, a third author would be chosen to write a third book, or maybe a third and fourth, or whatever. And let's say that these authors came from different places. What if the first author was an American? And he wrote his story from an American point of view. Suppose the second author was from Central America and wrote his from an Hispanic point of view. And suppose the third person, the third author, was a European. And let's suppose that this institution that you left in trust could continue and function for 1,500 years, collect 66 books from 40 different authors all over the world, put them together, do you think they would gel? Do you think they would fit together like this fits together? I'm going to tell you the answer is an absolute no because that would require a miracle. And that's why I say the Bible is a miracle. From a literary standpoint, there is nothing else like the Bible on the earth. People say, well, we don't have any of the original manuscripts. We don't have the original copies. Well, that's true. We also don't, to our knowledge, have any original copies of most ancient literatures. We don't have as much proof that Shakespeare actually wrote any of his work than we have. We have less proof of that than we have of God's Word being written by the people that we're told wrote it. And yet nobody seems to ever doubt Shakespeare. I don't understand that. But 
there is another thing that you hear from skeptics. Skeptics will say, well, I'm not going to put my faith and trust in God and what God has told me. I believe in science. I've heard people say that even recently, especially recently. A lot of people will say, I believe in science. Okay, that's fine, but science, by definition, is constantly changing. Science is always evolving. The whole act of science, the very purpose of science, is that we continuously learn, update the database that we have, update our knowledge. It changes. For example, if you got sick today, let's say you had um, cancer, would you want to be treated with the medical science that was available in, say, the 1500s? You know, in those days, if you had an infection, and they didn't really even understand what an infection was, but their best method of treating it was to try and bleed you and bleed it out of your system. Now, the infection may not kill you, but you'd probably bleed to death. So I always ask people when they say, no, I, I trust science. I say, well, science is always changing, so your faith must change and adapt to science. It's interesting that scientists once thought that the earth was flat, even though Job, in what is uh, considered to be the oldest story in the Old Testament, Job understood that the heavenly bodies were spherical. He talked about that. He didn't think anything that floating in the, in the sky and the universe was flat. It's kind of an interesting thing, but I wanted to quote something. There are some very famous people in our history who had some interesting things to say about the Bible. It is impossible to rightfully govern the world without God and the Bible, said George Washington. John Adams called it the best book in the world, while Lincoln said, take all of this book upon reason that you can, and the balance by faith, and you will live and die a better man. Woodrow Wilson said this, the Bible is the word of life. I beg that you will read it and find out for yourself. Theodore Roosevelt, who was one of our most beloved presidents, said this, Almost every man who has by his life work added to the sum of human achievement of which the race is proud, almost every such man has based his life work largely upon the teachings of the Bible. And so when we say that we believe the Bible, that we trust the Bible, that it's good guidance for our lives, you are in very good company. So I want us to read Psalm 119, 1 through 11. And then we're going to break it down and look at the individual verses. Verse 1 says, Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm of all of the psalms. And how appropriate that, the, that God would see fit to put the most emphasis on the one psalm that specifically and directly addresses the Word of God and how it ministers to the child of God. You need the Word of God. It is designed to minister to you. There are eight words that are used in these scriptures in 119 to talk about the Word of God. They're law, testimony, precept, statute, commandment, judgment. Now, that's not judgment as in punishment. It's judgment as in a rule for living. Word and promise. And so those eight words that are used to describe the scripture are 
they're carried over and over and over again through Psalm 119. It is like a drum beat all the way through the psalm. So I want you to keep something else in mind. We don't actually know who wrote this psalm. We're not told in the scripture who wrote it, but it almost certainly predates the completion of the Old Testament. So what I'm trying to say is, at the time that Psalm 119 was written, the Old Testament would have not been finished. It would have not been a finished product. And of course, the New Testament did not come along until after Jesus Christ and the cross. So if you think about this, when the psalmist is telling you how very important the Word of God is, he only has part of the Old Testament to use. I say that because a lot of people today will tell you the New Testament is all you need. The Old Testament doesn't count. It's just history. It's interesting reading, but it doesn't really apply. That's not true. Also keep in mind, in the first century, when the early church was birthed in the first years of the early church in the first decades, the New Testament was not written and completed. And so the very early church only had the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. That's all they had to go by. And so all of the Bible is important. And don't ever think that the Old Testament somehow doesn't matter anymore. So I want us to look at these verses and I want us to just break them down a little bit. Verse 1, when he says that blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. We often think of the law in a negative sense. We think of the law as uh, something that's designed to catch us and punish us. When we studied the Ten Commandments a few weeks ago, we talked about the fact that the law was not given as our judgment and our punishment. The law was given to open our eyes, to help us see our need, to help us recognize the state of lostness that we are in without Christ. That's why Christ came and physically took on human flesh and fulfilled the law and did what we could not do and did it for us so that by grace and mercy, we could be atoned for our sins and our inability to live a perfect life under the law. And so I want you to consider that the law is not a weapon, it's a tool. The law is a tool that God uses to sharpen us, to strengthen us, to convict us, and to draw us to Jesus Christ. Now, verse 2, he says this, Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. It is about being surrendered to God, seeking God with all your heart. Your heart, as we've said many times, is a reference to the thinking part of you, not this organ within your chest, but your personality, your mind, your will, your motives, your attitudes. When I think of my wife, for example, I think of her heart, her mind. That's the person that I most relate to. Yes, I can see her physical body in front of me, and I know that she has an eternal soul and the Holy Spirit that lives in me also lives in her, but it is her mind that I interact with on a daily basis, and it is absolutely critical. This is why we've talked about being surrendered to God means that we surrender to his will for us to be saved, to be transformed by the renewing of the mind, to follow in a life of holiness, and then the scripture says, then we can begin to know what his good, pleasing, and perfect will is for us. And so verse 3, he says, they do nothing wrong. In other words, he's talking about people who have surrendered to God. He says they do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. Now, this was written as poetry, and I want you to understand he is not trying to tell you that you'll be perfect. Don't take one scripture out of the entire Bible and try to build your doctrine around it. Take the totality of the scripture. So look at something else that this very author says in verse 25. If you have your Bible, flip over to 25 and read something that he says. 
He says, I am laid low in the dust. Preserve my life according to your word. What is he saying when he talks about being laid low in the dust? He's talking about being in dust and ashes. He's talking about being in a state of repentance. That means he's recognizing that he has drifted away from God. And he is saying, according to your word, Lord, preserve my life. He goes on to say, I recounted my ways and you answered me. Teach me your decrees. So when he says that we don't do anything wrong, he's not saying we are perfect, but what he's saying is we don't willfully and deliberately choose to live outside the will of God. We make mistakes, but when we do, we feel convicted. We come before God. We come in an attitude of repentance, and we say, Now, Lord, teach me how to overcome this so that I don't continue in this pattern. We see a mistake as a teaching opportunity. Now, don't get me wrong and think that you should go out and commit a bunch of sins so that you can open up teaching opportunities for yourself. But on the other side of the coin, when you do fail, do not let Satan continually beat you up and tell you that you're beyond hope. You go before God in an attitude of repentance and you say, Lord, I've messed up. But you teach me, you preserve me, and you help me overcome this. You help me be stronger than this. So look at verse 4. He says, you have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Now, this is a deep, deep verse. It seems on the surface like it's very shallow. There's not much to it. But I want you to realize this one verse is the whole basis for most atheism. Because as an atheist, a person has decided God doesn't exist there are no rules except the ones that man gets to make up. Therefore, I can do what I want to do. If I accept that God is sovereign, that he is what he claimed he was, and that's why Paul said in Romans chapter 1 that the world was in such a mess because they know, remember what we learned? That he is there, that he is eternal. He has always been there. That he is what? Divine. He's holy. He's perfect. He's righteous. And he's all powerful. If he is that, then guess what? He gets to make the rules. He gets to decide how we can live. So if I don't want to live according to God, I simply reject him and say he doesn't exist. Therefore, I don't have to follow his rules. Now that doesn't actually make God disappear. God is ever present and he's not going away just because people don't believe in him or they choose to reject him. But the scripture says that it is a choice to reject him because ultimately in the heart, in the mind, they know the truth about him. This is why it is so important for you and I who recognize the sovereignty of God, that we cling to it, that we realize he is in charge, he is the rule maker, and I have to obey him if I want to have joy and peace and love in my life. Look at verse 5. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. It is a reminder of our imperfect striving. He's saying, I wish... I wish, I wish, I wish I was steadfast. I wish I did not mess up. I wish I didn't make mistakes. Have you ever felt that way? Do you realize God knows you feel that way sometimes? God realizes that you feel sometimes like a failure, like a spiritual failure. And God's word is here to guide you and to encourage you to continue to strive that we can be closer to Christ and be more like Christ. Now look at verse 6. He says something very interesting. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all of your commands. In other words, I think he's saying, if I just could stay on track and not mess up and not sin against you, then I wouldn't have to be ashamed of my sin. Sin is shameful. But God has not called us to live in shame. That's why God has told us that we can come to him in an attitude of repentance. 
I teach people daily repentance. I believe every single day we need to repent of every single thing we can think of that we have done wrong. And I even sometimes say, Spirit of the living God, help me know, help me, uh, teach me, tell me, show me the things I have done that I'm not even aware of. Things that I have done so callously that I didn't even realize I had sinned. And if I can't think of them, please forgive me for the things I have done, but make my heart clean today. Today, Lord, let my heart be clean. And there is another ad aspect of shame that follows along with that. When I am no longer living in shame because of my sin, but living in joy and in victory because Christ has overcome sin and has promised to forgive me and to continue to forgive me every day of my life. Because of that, I'd have no reason to be ashamed of the gospel message. I have no reason to be ashamed to tell people, this is what I cling to. This is how I live my life. This is what I believe. Now, look with me, if you would, at verse 7. He says, I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. Have you ever felt convicted during the worship service? I will be very honest with you. It's quite odd to actually be the worship leader leading people in worship songs and feel the need to stop and repent of something I suddenly feel convicted about. But there have been times I've had to do that very thing. And I think that it's because praise is very humbling. It's hard to praise when you're proud unless you're praising yourself. And uh, Think about it like this. When you are encouraging other people, when you are praising other people, and I don't mean praising them as if they were God, but I simply mean praising them and encouraging them telling them how much they mean to you, it's very humbling. I can't, I can't really be focused how, on how awesome I think I am while I'm telling somebody else how awesome I know they are. And so praise is very humbling. We need to praise even when we don't feel like praising because praise can change your attitude. Praise works on the mind. And when I come into the worship service, when I come in, and I especially appreciate the way Miss Jane and Miss Judy, they prepare songs in advance. Uh, and we just simply call it a prelude. And people sort of think, well, you know, that's just the music that we listen to while we're coming in and, and we're talking to each other and deciding what we're going to have for lunch. No, that's designed to help us get our hearts right. That's designed to help me get in the right frame of mind as I'm sitting there in the sanctuary preparing myself to worship. That's designed to get me a little closer to the Lord. And so when we praise, it is designed to humble us, to convict us. It shows us he's worthy of praise, and it's very, very humbling. You see, the presence of God moves us. But if I refuse to praise, I'm shutting the door to even feeling and registering that presence of God. I'm shutting that door and I'm saying, I don't want to feel your presence. I'm not going to praise you today. I'm going to sit here and I'm just going to get through this service and then I'm going to leave and, and, and pretend nothing happened to me today. That's not true praise. And so when he says, I will praise you with an upright heart. He's saying, I do this as I uncover and learn your righteousness. Praise and worship ultimately prepares our hearts to hear what God has laid on Dr. Sim's heart about the righteousness and the holiness of God. And so praise and worship is designed to get us to the throne so that we can hear, that we can feel the presence of God, open our hearts up and say, Lord, just fill us up. Look at verse 8. He says, I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. 
This is a beautiful, beautiful verse. And I can't help but wonder if the author knew about and was writing about Jacob. If you remember, Jacob tricked his father, tricked his brother, got a birthright that wasn't technically for him. He fled. He ran away from home because uh, his brother <laughs> couldn't stand him anymore. He had caused a rift within the family. He flees from God even by fleeing from family, fleeing from home. He's in a very unspiritual state at this point in his life. And yet, this is what God said to him. And this is in Genesis 28. God said, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. In other words, God is saying, you may be running away from me, but I'm going to run with you. That's an amazing thing. God went on to say this, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now, stop and think about that. How does that apply to me? What has God promised you? Well, he has promised if you call on the name of Jesus Christ in faith, he'll save you. So when you believe and you know in your heart that you have given yourself to Jesus Christ and that you have experienced a salvation experience, don't doubt it. Move forward. If you feel convicted and you feel that something's not right and maybe my salvation experience was just a head decision and not really a heart decision, then you need to deal with that. But if you're confident that God has truly saved you, move forward and trust God has promised you a place in heaven. Now, the second thing, God has promised you that if you surrender to him and, al and allow him to do this, he'll change the way you think. He'll transform you. That's a good way to know whether you're actually saved or not. Look at your life. How do you feel about life and how do you feel about things as compared to five years ago or 10 years ago or just when you were lost? Have you seen the growth in your life? Maybe you haven't really surrendered to this process of letting God transform the way you think. But God has promised you. He said, if you'll let me surrender to me, I'll save you. I'll change the way you think, which will give you joy. And the third thing we studied that God said that he would help us be holy. And the fourth thing he promised is that he would help us to understand his will for my life. That's an amazing thing. And that leads me to uh, this little supplement that I introduced to you Wednesday called The God of the Impossible. And the first week, we we're talking about the God of my plans. And the question that I asked you was, what are you planning to do next year that will matter beyond next year? What are you planning to do in 2021 that will matter for all eternity? Because here's the truth. When God saves you, he saves you for a purpose of bringing you into right fellowship with him. But he also saves you for another purpose of sharing the Great Commission, of sharing his gospel, of living it, of speaking it, teaching it, breathing it, acting it, singing it. <laughs> However, he has also called us to be Christ-like, which is why we have to be transformed. He has called us to be holy, for I am holy. So when God has saved you, he's called you to be so much greater than what you thought was possible so that he can then give you the plans, give you the desires of your heart. That's when you can begin to know what it is that God wants to specifically do with you. Why are you, in particular, here on this earth? And what are you doing that's going to matter for all of eternity? What are you doing to bring other people to Christ? What are you doing to teach other people about transformation and about holiness? And so I want us to pray about that. And I want you to understand, if you want to know how to plan your life according to God, you absolutely have to use his word for guidance. Let's pray about that. Our Father, we thank you so much for this glorious word that you have given us. Lord, we recognize it is an absolute miracle the way you have put this together. 
the way you have preserved it, you have kept it, you have protected it, and it is here for us, Father God, that we can study, know who you are, know what you expect of us, and Father God, know most importantly how to be saved and how to bring other people to Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would get involved in our plans, Lord, and reorient, if necessary, if necessary our plans to your plans, Father. And dear God, we ask that 2021 would be a year that you fulfill our desires to see this community changed by the gospel. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. And if you were able to be with us today in person, praise God for that. If not, we are going to continue this ministry because we want everyone to be safe, to be comfortable, because we love you. We think so much of you, and we're so very happy uh, that you just want to be involved in studying God's Word. God bless you.